Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. So nice to see you again this evening. It is January 11th in the year 1999 at approximately 7 p.m. Broadcasting to you from the Roxbury studio of BNN TV Cable Vision in Boston, Massachusetts. Tonight I'm going to speak about the serious situation that faces one American and all Americans regarding rights to privacy, due process, and rights against entrapment. We begin, of course, with one Bill Clinton, and I must say that I am not particularly partisan toward Bill Clinton. Some of you may not think so, but he doesn't particularly mean very much to me. He is a human being like any human being, and what is happening to a human being is of utmost concern to me, which is why I tell these things to you. We have, let us go back, a child person being born and raised in a poor state, practically one of the poorest in the nation at the time of Mr. Clinton's childhood. We have a person being raised in a state of segregation, a state of the infamous town city of Little Rock, Arkansas, with some of the momentous, where some of the momentous events of the civil rights movement took place in our history. We have a person witnessing and experiencing and living the life in this state, a state of poultry, a state of pigs, a state of poverty. Looking at the childhood of this person, it's someone reminiscent of the childhood of LBJ in Texas, who on the Mexican border witnessed a lot of poverty in his youth as well, which spurred him to some of the programs he tried to enact when he was president. We have a state which inculcates into its people an accent the likes of which usually do not grace the highest corridors of beautiful power in our nation. And we have a state so close to Tennessee, by the way, the home of the current vice president, Mr. Al Gore. So we have a child from a broken home. I don't know the whole detail of his life, but we do see pictures of a house he grew up in that veritably is a shack. It is not a Kenny Bunkport. It is not a San Clemente. It is not a Key Biscayne. We see a person who does not have his biological father, who is raised somewhat by a mother, and some other male is in the home. We hear of a person who dresses his brother and walks to church every Sunday, a person who belongs to the Southern Baptist religion at that time. A person of great popular appeal, not in the beginning, of course, when he was governor or first tried to be governor in Arkansas, uh, but one who learned and had charisma apparently and learned very much to be a populist and to enamor himself to as many people as possible uh, with a desire to appeal to as many and stay popular perhaps uh, for as much time um, as he could. Now, with Congress and with his own Democratic Party, uh, it is said these days that he has not been so popular even prior to now because with his shifting and changing and acclimatizing himself to, to doing as much that would be approved by as most as could be possible people, uh, this, this puts him perhaps at odds with with segments that would like him to be one or another way and not crafting himself to adapt and adjust to the popular will, so to speak, and popular favorability. He also has been accused of, accused of adopting Republican ideas as when he went along with the welfare cuts some time ago, uh, adopted the balanced budget, though, though that he has claimed to be one of his own ideas as well as that of the Republicans. Uh, if he did not, for example, uh, do cutting of welfare prior to that last election, he very well may not have gotten into office a second time as the nation was decidedly 
uh, generally speaking, in favor of those cuts. He just recently has increased the military under pressure from the Republicans, increased the spending for the military, which would not be one of his own emanating ideas. However, he does favor affirmative action. He has stood up for, though by, by their perspective, not enough for the gay community. Remember when he first tackled the gays in the military question, which caused him very much, tr much trouble and a lot of enemies in the beginning of his first term. He has stood with people who want rights to abortion. He certainly favors the environment, and as Al Gore comes into view more, and perhaps becomes a new president, uh, we will see a more heavy-handed and serious uh, con uh, consideration and emphasis given to environment. He favors public education, uh, which would not be a Republican idea, uh, um, as much as they would prefer charter schools and, uh, and uh, tax incentives and so on for persons to choose their own, for persons to choose their own schools. He did bomb Iraq, he did bomb the Sudan, and of course there was a lot of Republican support for the bombing of Iraq as there was Democratic. So some of his ideas adapt and shift and can be said to uh, be ad adapted to or adopted from those of the opposite party, uh, adapted to the will of the people and not necessarily always in sync with his own party uh, according to some agenda. In general, he definitely is favorable to health care. He is against Medicare cuts, which is not generally a Republican position as we know it. And he is for so-called saving Social Security uh, through government uh, management of that program rather than privatization, as so many persons are calling for now, many of them Republican. Uh, now, in Arkansas, from whence he hails, everybody is in bed with everybody. As people are in politics, uh, people get connections, they network, as people do in many professions. And uh, it's been said it's particularly so in a state like Arkansas. We can remember the politics of a certain Huey Long out of Louisiana, uh, of a similar kind of a background of, of, of connectivity of people in politics. and. Uh, in the past, Clinton has been uh, connected with Tyson Chicken and favors uh, to that corporation, which uh, has its base in Arkansas. Uh, Bill Clinton is a lover of music and uh, a, a knowledgeable person on rock and jazz and uh, just tends to be in sync and loving of music in general. Um, and he has a vision for social justice. Be what he will, be he a cur, be he uh, a person adapting to popular will, uh, he does have a vision of social justice. He has brains, most people admit to that reluctantly. Sometimes he was a Rhodes Scholar and he wrote a letter during the time of the Vietnam War to a military ra high-ranking person describing to him why he felt he could not serve in Vietnam and had changed his mind on that question, unlike so many people who either fled or um, gave themselves kinds of ailments to have so that they could be declared unfit for military service. He met his wife uh, somewhere, uh, I I really don't know where, but he met his wife, who is from Wellesley College, uh, attended Wellesley College in Massachusetts, uh, apparently a person of great political ambitions, of uh, both of them sharing, especially perhaps his wife, a kind of sense of classlessness, uh, perhaps a kind of socialism, put that in quotations, and certainly a kind of feminism on the part of Hillary, uh, not altogether uh, anything that grates or goes against the grain of her husband either, at least as far as the philosophies and practice of women getting ahead go. Um, he plays the saxophone, he jogged in shorts, and when he had his inauguration, he ha let people into the White House and shook 
hands for hours on end. Both he and his wife shook hands of people. It was quite a different kind of atmosphere, if, if only in ambience only, that took place when Bill Clinton was first inaugurated president. He ate McDonald's. He laughed a lot, even at political uh, meetings with people. I can remember him yucking it up, so to speak, with Boris Yeltsin. Uh, he he wear, wore shades. Uh, when he was asked about whether he would have used marijuana, could he have smoked it by teenagers, I remember watching on MTV, he said yes, he would have tried it. And he told us that he, when he was at Oxford and tried marijuana, he couldn't inhale it because of his uh, rhinitis and uh, nasal, nasal uh, problems that he constantly has, which he does have. And again, there is a technicality, which probably was true for a guy with as much um, sinus and uh, nasal laryngeal problems as he does suffer, probably did go against the grain, even if he might have been willing. Uh, his best friend from way back when, or certainly one of his best friends, is African-American male of, of dark complexion, a certain Vernon Jordan. His offices are filled with women and minorities, and in fact, after he was elected the last time, uh, C-SPAN had a lot of coverage of high-level meetings of the Democratic Party, and many of the people leading that party were African-American and female. He has a wife who doesn't bake cookies, she says, and doesn't stay at home, and doesn't use or preach religion in the way she approaches things, and who wants to move the country, or wanted to move the country, and even the world. He has a wife who doesn't have, quote unquote, sweet lips. Uh, he has a wife who is stern and cold and outspoken, a wife who has said that Palestine should have its own state, a wife who tried to get, give a great almost nationalization to health care and did not fail as much was sabotaged for her efforts. So when Bill Clinton and entourage brought their presidency to Washington, we saw a change for whatever, for the better, for the worse. We saw a flavor, a new flavor. We saw rhetoric. We heard rhetoric that we heard, hadn't heard before rhetoric along the lines of justice and inclusivity and what people need to live and get by in their everyday lives and what kind of quality of life we could be living. This was certainly not George Bush. It was not Newt Gingrich. It was not Dick Armey. Uh, it talked about humaneness and a kind of life and a quality and then inclusivity. It talked environment, health care, public education, social views, and the White House was filled with people that people, uh, other people complained were or criticized were way too young and uh, inexperienced to even be in the White House in the beginning. And there were so many changes and discombobulations along the early way. You can remember previous administrations, so to speak, uh, talking more along lines of military always and our strength and crime and how bad crime is and to decrease government regulation and to have supply side economics and regarding uh, decreased regulation by the way uh, so many things happen uh, when right now with the regulations that we do have but I'll just note one that went by the other day a company that was responsible for testing gasoline and the amount of oxygen they had recently was, was fined uh, to the tune of four million plus dollars for falsifying the reports it gave on the cleanliness of the gasoline that it was testing, for example, regarding uh, needs or not needs for government regulations on such matters. But of all the criminals and of all the sleaze and all the campaign corruption and all the wealth and all the wheel of dealers and of all the, the moss that a stone has to gather in order to be in politics, in order to compromise, in order to take the fight that should be fought but also has a chance of winning, of all the things a person has to do by the time he or she becomes president, let alone a governor, let alone a city councilor, 
people in this country still believe that we have to have this government, that we have to have a president, and of all, of all the possibilities of who this could be and how this person could be that president, Bill Clinton is the president, and people are sort of saying implicitly, you're it. You're it, and that's the way it goes, of all the others and of all the corruption. And not you, what they're saying furthermore, apparently, is that not you or anybody can be entrapped, denied due process, forced to meet a higher standard than the average citizen, be singled out from your peers for acts that are committed or could be committed by functionally quite a few, if not virtually most people, have your privacy invaded. These are principles that belong to the United States of America and that belong to human justice. Now, sometimes when I've watched C-SPAN recently, uh, persons have said, uh, called in many times and, and talk about how Bill Clinton was entrapped and sometimes the reporters on that program or on other shows will talk about, yes, or even not admit yes, but say, right now we're having a trial, that's what we must focus on. No, what we must focus on is how we ever got to have this trial. We can't let go of that very incipient primary and never to be let go of problem. It is not where we are now, it is where we should never be now because of the genesis of the current situation. Furthermore, the bulk of our role models, which is no excuse, are screwing around, so to speak. It's our way of life. We don't condemn people for this. Besides that we shouldn't even be at this stage of the game. Now, look, for example, at supposedly one of the most beloved recent figures in history, Princess Diana, and the lifestyle that she led, or Princess Fergie, whom people find take so much interest in. The day Diana died, or the day Diana had an anniversary of her death, was also a time around which Mother Teresa died and had an anniversary one year later. And people were commenting how little was portrayed of Mother Teresa, who presumably is the moral do-gooder, and how much was revered and needed and desired by people for Princess Diana. Look at our interest and belated adoration of Marilyn Monroe. Look at the influence of a person like Madonna. This is not a presidency of I've got mine and you, got, y you get yours. And when you, you're caught with your pants down, as in pa past times, for major, major crimes against the state and against the country, you don't just urinate on people and turn the other way. And when L.A. burned, at the time that it did, previous administrations went to L.A. and did not even meet with the people involved directly in the burning of L.A., those responsible for it, those who had the gripes. In the structured society where the whole consideration is on haves preserving what the haves have without even consciously trying to be in that modality, what, it, what people's business is about is a consolidation of wealth. And that is going on right now as we speak. It's gone on in the past. But sometimes the atmosphere and the ambience of, of having that strict separation and, and enterprise defined in precisely that way can be more, more or less severe. And we also have increasing control of our land, our food, and our services. And uh, while, while it might be that uh, there is a uh, great effect of, of corporations to keep any kinds of restrictions and regulations off of what they engage in, on the other hand, there are many things about the state, even in an era of decreased a cry for decreased government in people's lives, there are many things about the state that are getting more policing. 
Uh, for example, there's much more policing at airports because of terrorism. There's more policing on Florida highways because of drugs. There's more policing for people wearing seatbelts because of insurance companies uh, caring about money they pay out from accidents. There are, I hear, 25 people currently being held in jail, mostly around alleged terrorism, who are held there without knowing the evidence against them. It's evidence held in secret, and they are being held in jail. There is more permission for tapping and, and, and uh, intercepting people's conversations by the government. There is certainly more possibility for child services to come into the homes of people and make decisions on children and parents. Uh, then there are other things that are happening to Bill Clinton himself. So while we see the cries for decreased government regulation, we also see things that are happening that make it easier for the state to maintain control. And we have to ask ourselves, to what end do we have the role of government decrease or increase? This is a debate we should be having instead of being asleep or disinterested or not thinking along these terms. Some of our daily diet and mind fodder should be concerned about how we're going to live together. Do we need government? What kind of government do we need? If we need it, why do we need it? And how does it work out and really affect us. Certainly when it comes to public lands and water, for example, we should be mutually caring that these things stay public, stay clean, and aren't bought up and franchised, cut down, or, or, or taken away, or, or misused even for the sake of nature herself. After all the blood, sweat, and tears that have gone into the making of a country where there are, or at least traditionally have been, so many things so public, like a beautiful library, for example, also. In any event, money does rule, and uh, whatever money has in mind, will be the agenda often, and that could be valueless. That could be purely commerciality, which is a lot of what we see today, people trying to sell, trying to market, trying to get some dollars out of people, uh, and that kind of a rule, where does that lead? What happens to everything that gets affected by com pure commerciality where uh, there are no rules, so to speak, uh, hands off, free enterprise, and if things get spoiled, ruined, or are miserable or unfair in the process, or don't contribute to people having a better quality of life in the short and long run, uh, that should be a concern of ours. So many of the problems we have can only be taken care of in, in a contract, implicit contract we have an awareness with each other. And, and right now, we aren't particularly aware that we're even related to each other. There are also questions like science and genetic engineering, uh, prisons and the law. Uh, there's even a, a, a question right now in Boston when the snow falls or the ice comes, uh, since it is wintertime. We put a heavy-duty salt on the road that is not really safe uh, for people to to have contact with, and this salt must eat into the, uh, the tar on the road, uh, so that must cost money from that point of view, but worst of all, uh, so much of it is poured on and goes into the water. More harsh chemicals going into the water instead of the old-fashioned, so to speak, way of dealing with ice and snow, which was to plow it or to put sand on it. I don't know how this salt became so much in vogue. Pro things like this all around us. And what about the damage it does to the uh, metal of automobiles? 
And there are problems also like what gets on television. Isn't it always one kind of commercial thing? And I've heard so many people complain about not being able to get their points of views onto the television or presenting television always as entertainment even when it should be something serious. There's so much that, as individuals, we cannot control alone, just try to make ourselves comfortable, make a living, cut ourselves off, be secure in an apartment or a home somewhere. There are so many things that will impinge on each and every one of us and all of us together, because only in talking and relating with each other and being commonly attuned to what we need together can many of our major difficulties be resolved, or at least attended to. Now, regarding this one Bill Clinton, whom I started with in talking about his vision, philosophies of government, different ideas we have to think about in doing government, we also go to the idea that people are tired of judging, and at this stage in our history, people generally are not so sure of who's good and who's bad. And people have seen enough, for example, when they have seen Watergate, when they have seen the Iran-Contra, when they have seen Vietnam, when they have seen the Bay of Pigs, Allende in Chile with the CIA, the Shah of Iran, Herbert Hoover, the war between Iraq and Iran when the United States built Iraq up to the very minute practically before it invaded Kuwait, that is Iraq. Marv Albert, Jim Baker, I think of the line again from Mick Jagger, every cop is a criminal and all the sinners saints. People have seen plenty of this to be educated in these matters. Martin Luther King, Thomas Jefferson, Ed Meese, as Gil Scott Heron once said in a song of his, the revolution will not be televised. And he, what he didn't add, but I would add, but the coup d'etat will. And the coup d'etat can happen by persons televised on TV in gentlemanly suits with arthritic postures. And people looking, seeing this background of things they have found out about persons in positions of prestige and honors, now they may see justice as a joke, news as entertainment, justice as a joke, justice as a TV event, a game of deception. And when we look at the players, and the emotion, the kind of emotion that they bring to it, the Judiciary Committee, the prosecutorial mindset, the long-standing attempt to do something, do anything, to make this president either step down or certainly suffer greatly. We are reminded that justice is blind but that it is blind with rage. And when people, of many of whom are, are rageful and hell-bent on getting someone and the emotions take over, persons can't see straight and their opinions and the moves they make are thwarted and perverted by this emotion of rage. Uh, I even heard that Bob Barr, who is a very big House player in what has come down in the Congress, signed a book that was about impeaching Bill Clinton, the president, one year prior to any of this recent information having ever been put out in public. This is some kind of desire to dislike and divest a person of any status whatsoever. And certainly, 
a condition of having blinders on. Then there is the silliness regarding it being a TV event. The minute it got to this stage and Justice Rehnquist of the Supreme Court was going to preside in the Senate over the so-called trial, he no longer could walk outside, take his daily walks and so on because cameras galore surrounded him wherever he was. Now why is that? Why should cameras have to run over to Justice Rehnquist and film his every move? How silly is that? And how is it I have heard that Justice Rehnquist put some stripes on his robe that I don't know if he was supposed to put them on, but it seemed people were talking that for pomp and circumstance, he put stripes on his robe as he sat to be the judge presiding over the Senate. And people didn't seem to think they took note, they took note of this action and added a question mark to it, so to speak. So people might be looking at all this as just another media feed, and if anybody knows how bad this is, it's the consumers of media. And fortunately, there is still some tradition, some spirit of who we are and where we've come from that won't digest the current entertainment that's being thrown at people. Fortunately, what's being done in Washington currently bounces back and doesn't sit well. Fortunately, to many people, apparently, it smells like something is rotten and pious in Denmark. And people won't forget, and people don't forget, is what I would say. Do not forget when the next election comes around and do not be sleepy. Do not be a person who doesn't think about things and doesn't vote, who doesn't participate in thinking how we're going to live together no matter how distant or foreign or alien the people who are running for office seem to be or the process seems to be. Politics and how we run ourselves and our country is everybody's business. But anyway, the damage that has been done when we did do the impeaching in the trial and went fo uh, impeaching in the House and went forward with that scenario, the damage that was done from that is irrevocable. We, 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 we fell into an abyss. We crossed an abyss from which we can never come back to where we were before. This was a huge marker for where history will take us now in this country. We can never regain our claim to fairness and true truth. Our heritage of Western civilization, of intellectual discovery, of the best human capacity possible with the brain and the mind to think these things through properly rather than be spiteful and filled with rage, of civility, of equality under the law. Not this time. This time we have gone too far. And it goes to show that there are no protections and there is no system that is guaranteed. And people often say, what will be history's read on the subject? Won't Bill Clinton look terrible? Isn't he not miserable because his place in history is being despoiled? History's read as time goes on of the things that have gone down will be to show what people can do when they get carried away. And the foolhardiness wrong-mindedness and much too quick action, much too unthoughtful action, they without thinking reactionarily take. And what can happen to people caught up in this kind of situation? 
let's just do a quick review of the items that have been so immoral, incorrect, unsophisticated, unworthy for a country that has the reported reputation of the United States of America. Bill Clinton was pursued way back in Little, Little Rock and persons who were Capitol police or security guards at that time testified against him supposedly and supposedly took back their testimony and said they were lying. Who knows the background to this? But people were trying to get testimony out of persons around Bill Clinton back in Little Rock, Little Rock. He was pursued in Washington, we all know. The day he was elected president, some people said, he's not my president, and we'll get him. And they never stopped. Some people never stopped. They gave him double jeopardy, triple jeopardy. Usually when you're investigated for something, if that doesn't work out, you don't try something else. And if that doesn't work out, you don't try something else. And go on and on and keep trying something till you find something you can use that will stick. Uh, his wife, Bill Clinton's wife, Hillary, was thrown into the closet, into the dungeons of the earth for trying to revolutionize health care. Some people say what a terrible thing she would have done to health care when in reality the so-called system we have right now is defunct, bare-threaded, and shameful, frankly. Some people saw this as the 60s, in a sense, gaining momentum or, or coming into the future. And they might have wanted to take back the 60s when Bill Clinton was elected president. Let's look at a meeting between congressional persons who very much opposed Bill Clinton and were driving forces behind the current situation, meeting with the federal judges who chose Kenneth Starr, a known opposition person to Bill Clinton, to be the so-called independent counsel on the case. Is there something wrong with that? Is there something very, very wrong with that setup? A Kenneth Starr known to have intended to file a friend of the court brief in the Paula Jones case. Prior to having his own situation to take care of with the Monica Lewinsky story. A Kenneth Starr known to be in communication with attorneys for Paula Jones way in advance. A Kenneth Starr also known to have been an advocate for tobacco and coming from a law firm heavily involved in the defense of tobacco. And no matter where you stand on the tobacco issue, Bill Clinton is an utmost enemy of tobacco people. Now, does someone involved with tobacco on their side go against him as an in independent? That word chokes in my throat as I try to say it. Kenneth Starr is known to dislike the president intensely, and he is the independent counsel. Kenneth Starr is known to talk with Lucy Goldberg and Linda Tripp. Is that obscene? Is that immoral? Way back when, is known to have talked with them. Prior to there being any taping, is there something wrong with this in the history of Western civilization? There is Linda Tripp, always on the scene, Filegate, Foster's, so Foster's suicide, Kathleen Willey leaving the president's office, Linda Tripp on the phone talking to Monica, telling Monica, Monica, you, you are through in Washington. You'll never, you'll never be able to work here. And Monica asking who says so. And, and, and Linda Tripp not answering her who this is, but that somebody in the know is telling her she's through in Washington and that Monica should ask for a job. And she should ask for a job in New York, being prodded by Linda Tripp to do this in the notorious phone conversations. Linda Tripp, who prior to taping, is in communication with Kenneth Starr, who is chosen by federal judges, who also meet with the rabid congressional persons who are against Bill Clinton.
Now also, how about daring to ask about consensual, desired, free will, guaranteed under the Constitution, sex, whether you believe in the family values of it or not, daring to ask about this in an harassment case, which has to be about a pattern of harassing and denying people favors, not giving them jobs, not helping them along, not having a good time sexually with them consensually, but harassing them, daring to ask about that in a case that is about harassment. Daring to call the per president a molester, as so many people did. Uh, Citizens call him a molester. Other persons in the early stages of this referred to him as molesters, people in the political scene. Certainly a dirty old man, a big old creep. Surely not to call him names. A dirty old man, maybe, like so many. I mean, not to, not to defend. But what is the difference between the president and so many males and what they do and would like to do? And what about lifting one's dress to show a thong to the president alone in his study late at night or during the day or whenever it was? And who's molesting whom? And when do both parties own their experience, not just one? Uh, a topic that I take up on a previous show I have called Who Are You? And also daring to talk as so much has been said talk about punishing the president. This is not allowed if we had our intellectual thinking caps on. Impeachment is not punishment. It is removal. It is a step towards removal of a president from office. The Congress by the Constitution is not allowed to pu punish. Impeachment is a method of getting rid of somebody who has done a crime against the state, and yet people talk about punishment. And to better understand this, think back to Watergate. In the Watergate times, if you lived in those times, nobody was saying, oh, we have to punish Richard Nixon, he's such a bad boy. No, people were startled and they said, oh my goodness, we can't have this in government, he has to leave, big difference. But now, because it's sex, and in another show I had called Sex Vigilantes, where I talk about sex punishment and guilt, I go into this. Now, because it was about sex, we talk about punishing the president, and yet intellectually, if we had our right minds about it, this is not allowed for the Congress to do to the president. Daring to drop a load of papers onto the House of Representatives, 60,000 pages long, which was not a report dropped by Kenneth Starr, just all the, all the pages in no particular organized form, no report form so that people could marvel at the cigars and the breath and think ill of the president and have the whole lurid part about sex out there. And anybody who's going to be talked about in a sex position is going to be humiliated. And while you give this so-called report, just dumping all these pages out there, you leave out in this unerudite piece of pornography, you leave out a statement by Monica Lewinsky that no one ever asked me to lie. You somehow managed to leave that out. For the so-called independent counsel to go before the House committee and advocate that the president be impeached when he is not allowed to do that, when his role is to be an independent counsel and merely collect the facts and leave it for the Congress to decide. And to do this before persons who have illicit affairs and trade in sex, like so many males, Chairman Hyde, Dan Burton, Bob Livingston, and yet when the information about Hyde was found out, I know we're going to go to the lying about oath scenario. We're going to say it's not about sex. When the information about Hyde was brought out, some Republicans were saying, Henry Hyde is a wonderful person. This should not be said about him. 
And there were, in those days, so much talk about the sexual aspect of it. And to this day, people talk about the sexual aspect of it. And yet people are not ashamed of their hypocrisy. The average citizen, in, in times when people have met about this, to be oppositional to Bill Clinton, I hear them talking, oh, luridly about the cigar. To this day, to the cigar he used in the sexual act, or in the kind of sex that he had, I hear, have heard people say time and again, how dare he use the Oval Office? If it's not about sex, what are they worried if it's the Oval Office for? And I hear people say so often today, that molester, that pervert belongs out of the White House. If it's not about sex, why are those kinds of ideas on people's minds? And you know, I like the way people will dare, dare to judge character publicly and, and say, yours is bad, mine must be good. It's like a self-appointed, high-order personhood that people give themselves. You're so bad, I'm so good is the other side of that equation. And I talk about this kind of sense of morality and what really is morality in another TV show I've done called None Dare Call It Treason. Anyway, so many of us have become so sensitized to not dare condemn people for many of the things I've pointed out up till now this evening. The antagonists are so needy of their desired outcome that they let nothing stand in their way, not entrapment, not rights to privacy, not due process as when the president wasn't allowed to see a document against him when the documents were brought to the house, he wasn't allowed to see them. I've seen and heard of things like this, as has said Alan Dershowitz, in communist Russia and China, where trials go on, but what really is going on in terms of legality and justice. And even now, there were, there were people talking about new evidence coming into the Senate from the House, and the President wasn't allowed to know about this. Always new evidence, and he's not allowed to know. And then there was all that time when he wasn't allowed to know the outcome of all the previous in investigations prior to Monica Lewinsky. That was kept from him, that nothing was found out that would, that would charge him with anything from those investigations. Always kept in the dark, always dangling the threat, there's more coming. We don't do that in the United States of America, at least in theory, at least historically. And the president was called to testify, and politically, supposedly, he had to be in a position where he couldn't plead the fifth, and he was in a position where he had to more or less incriminate himself. And he asked, what do you mean by sex? A technicality. And by that technicality, he answered according to the definition given him. And he had a right to obfuscate and step around the issue because people have a right to keep themselves from being incriminated. Even murderers who, who are facing a trial are asked, how do you plead? And they say, not guilty. I'm getting near the end, so I'm going to move towards a few final points that recently there was a case of child pornography where the FBI sent materials to people in a sting operation and a person who had not been purchasing this got these things and was solicited and bought them and then he was taken to trial because he bought child pornography that was thrown out of court because it was entrapment drug dealers time and again are not 
continued on trial or have a trial dismissed or seen as, as not viable because some step of the way was entrapment, some step of the way denied due, due process, some step of, of the way got evidence in ways that are not legal to get evidence. We are losing our collective mind. We are losing our intelligence. And let's get to the final point here of lying under oath. The president was technically correct in his deposition. He was technically correct when he shook his finger and said, I did not have sexual relations as defined in the deposition with that woman. Whether he committed perjury is an open question, and people who just throw this term around, oh, he committed perjury, that is not allowed to be done. Allegedly, at best, he committed perjury. You can't not just say that. Perjury must be proven. And there are levels of lies. And is it a lie when people don't come forward and tell you the conflict of interest, claim to be independent, and have an agenda, and set traps? and collude and conspire. Is that any kind of a lie? And do we, by right, stop where the real problem lies? I will, I will conclude here with the statement of wait till something like this happens to you. And now that this abyss has been fallen into, and after this damage has been done, the free reign for more of this to happen to more people are there. And my final comment to you is that invasion of privacy and entrapment and denial of due process are coming to a theater near you. Good evening. Thanks for watching. Please tune in again. Addendum. The matter about which I have just spoken was improper to ever have been investigated, improper to tape, immaterial to the case of Paula Jones. This is the beginning, the end, and the cause for alarm to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We cannot dismiss travesty. We dare not, though we do dismiss the flag of freedom which says, don't trample on me. We have failed ourselves to let our brains be so dusty that we desecrate our most sacred rights. Every further step, every misstep, has potholes, craters abounding. Technicality is law in 1998. Technicality is life in 1998. Trying to defend oneself is fundamental. It was reported recently that Kenneth Starr paid a female prostitute from Arkansas to take a test to see if her son could be a child of Bill Clinton, an egregious abuse of freedom careening out of control. When hearings in the House of Representatives were held recently regarding the matter about which I have spoken, it was disallowed by the leaders of the majority and more astoundingly put up with by others that no one could talk about Kenneth Starr, who he was, what he did, and how he did it. When the final arguments were held in the House soon thereafter, no one was allowed to ask for censure or for a vote on censure, though so many persons pleaded that this would happen. Regarding people who use World War II as the real generation, the gutsy generation, the war they fought for, it can be asked. What about veterans since that time? Are they inconsequential? World War II was not fought for rule of law, so to speak, as articulated by Henry Hyde recently. World War II was fought for freedom, the kind of freedom denied by entrapment, denial of due process, denial of free speech, invasion of privacy, denial of having to adhere to proper rules of evidence, 
People who fought in World War II or their relatives and friends or who fought in any and all wars in this country feel many different ways about the events in Washington surrounding Bill Clinton. Persons who believe in freedom, human rights, lawfulness, and the Constitution come in many stripes and colors, many shapes and forms, have both fought in wars and not and suffer as much or as little as anyone for what they live and believe. No point of view owns World War II. No point of view owns God. No point of view owns truth. Usually, when people disagree, one of two ways is taken. Either they ignore each other or they go to war. But there is another option, and that is to talk and listen and be civil towards each other. To be open, no matter how hard this is, and to not pretend to talk with formality and protocol, but to really be a free and open society, not even a politically correct society, where we can mix it up with each other, give each other free reign to unabashedly talk about what we really think and how we really feel. Some persons can understand how others hold a particular view, appreciate that view, and yet disagree. This is because theirs is the broader and more encompassing picture, the forest from the trees, the truth behind the truth. In a democracy, we have to live with what we don't like, tolerate points of views we cannot stand and people we cannot stand, and be civil about it.